sorry. I'm blocked out. Na uh, everything came back to me as if I'm now in back to 1993. 21-year-old Mary Eileen Sarmenta, known as Eileen, was a graduating student of the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, and majored in agriculture with an interest in food and nutrition for large animals. She also took part in the Sigma Delta Phi sorority on campus, and it was there that she befriended her batchmate, 19-year-old Alan Gomez. Those close to Alan described him as a funny guy, and he was part of the Upsilon Sigma Phi fraternity. The year is 1993, and during this period, Antonio Sanchez was the mayor of the city of Calawan, Laguna, where the university stayed. During Eileen's academic year, she went to interview Mayor Sanchez for the school paper, but it was nothing short of a brief interaction, and the academic year went on. It is a humid, cloudless Monday evening, the 28th of June, 1993, and Eileen and Alan are on their way home. Earlier in the day, they attended their classes at the University of the Philippines at Los Baños, which resided in Laguna Province. Presently, they are in front of the passenger seats of a Toyota Tamara van parked in front of Cafe Amalia, a restaurant in Agrix Complex, a sprawling area just a distance away from the university compound. And so is the van, which serves as a public utility transport vehicle and lies in wait until it is fully occupied by commuters. But the young pair's journey back home is suddenly disrupted. Six armed men suddenly appear from nowhere and head straight to the stationary Toyota. What ensues next is brief and precise. Eileen and Alan are dragged out, then forcibly brought back inside their vehicle. This time, the two students find themselves seated at the back seat. Immediately, they are gagged and their hands tied. In a minute, the van driven by the armed men is speeding out of the complex area. Trailing the van is an ambulance where the armed men had ridden in going to the complex. Eventually, the vehicle reached its destination, Erais Farm. It is a privately owned farm which is used by its owner as a sanctuary for relaxation and a hiding place away from the topsy-turvy world where he belongs. As soon as the two vehicles have arrived, the men inside climb out, bringing out their captives. When the young pair steps out of the vehicle, a mop-haired man emerges from one of the rest houses in the farm to meet them. He is Mayor Antonio Sanchez. He is also the owner of the farm, which is one of his various properties. Mayor, this is our gift to you, the girl you've been longing for, says one of the armed men in a wicked voice. The mayor says she's really beautiful, but who's that man? His gaze is now focused on Alan. Earlier, before his men had arrived, the mayor was worried sick, thinking that they would not be able to bring their gift to him. Eileen's companion boss, says another man. We brought him along to avoid complications. Prior to the kidnapping, all six of the mayor's men met up in their van headed to the university at Los Baños. Along the way, one of the men announced to the group that the real purpose behind their trip was to take a pretty young woman, long desired by the mayor, and offer her to him as a gift. To satisfy his companion's curiosity, the man even guaranteed that her beauty would make their saliva drip. The two were then brought back inside the rest house where Eileen was taken to the mayor's room, while Alan was badly beaten up by five of the men and then thrown out of the rest house. One of the men followed up by striking Alan's diaphragm with the butt of an armalite, causing Alan to fall against a cement box. One thought Alan was already dead, but another man said, his death will come later. Meanwhile, the sixth man and the driver, while waiting for further orders, joined the mayor's personal aides to watch television at the adjacent rest house. At around 1 a.m. of the next day, a crying Eileen was dragged out of the rest house by two of the men, her hair disheveled, mouth covered by a handkerchief, hands still tied and stripped of her shorts. The mayor appeared with only a white polo shirt on and thanked the men for the gift, saying, I am through with her, she's all yours. 
When asked what will happen to Alan, a man assured the mayor that they will also kill him for full measure. Eileen and Alan were then loaded into the van by the six men and headed for Kalawan, followed closely by the ambulance. While driving to Kalawan, the man who was driving the ambulance noticed the van in front of him swaying from side to side. Then he heard gunfire coming from the car and saw the van pulled over where one man dragged Alan, whose head was already drenched in blood, out of the vehicle onto the road and finished him off with a single gunshot with his arm alight. The ambulance and van then sped away. The next destination was a sugarcane field where one man announced that it's time for the group to feast on Eileen. She was laid at the back of the van with her hands and legs being held by the men while waiting for their turn. Then the assault began. Bewailing the helplessness of her situation, Eileen pleaded in between sobs and whimpers for the torture to stop. However, her tears for compassion fell, weak and ineffective upon those monsters. One man invited the driver to join the fiasco, but he refused as he later said that he could not bear the bestiality being committed on Eileen, who appeared to be dead. Afterwards, Eileen knelt on the seat of the van and begged for her life. In her words, she said, please, you have taken everything from me, my shame, my honor, but please spare me my breath. It's the only thing I've got left. Unmoved, the lead man muted Eileen's cries by forcing the handkerchief into her mouth and then fired his baby armor light at her. The driver was thereafter ordered to get rid of Eileen's dead body. Moments later, all six men boarded the ambulance and proceeded to Kalawan, leaving the van with Eileen's remains behind. Later that same morning, some of the men regrouped and took it upon themselves to launch a fake operation. They revisited the location where they left the body of Alan Gomez and began inspecting him. The ambulance driver had been tasked to make an immediate report to the Kalawan Municipal Hall about the discovery of a dead body of an unidentified young man. At that very same time, one of the men is also at the Municipal Hall making a report to a cop of another discovery of a dead person. This time, a young woman found inside of an abandoned Toyota Tamara van. The cop who receives the report, and also one of the six men, then makes a radio call to the town's police chief. Upon this receipt of the information, the men who are at the field with Alan Gomez's body leave and proceed to the location where Eileen has been found. One of them expresses pity at the sight of the dead female body and covers her with a sackcloth before escorting the van to the UP Los Baños police station. It is there where the two bodies are identified by the university students who have trooped to the station. Later that same day, the mayor is visited by his men at his house in Bai, another town in the province. The men told the mayor that members of the Criminal Investigation Service, the National Bureau of Investigation, and the media have swarmed the town. The mayor becomes livid, chastising his men for not using their heads, but then he reassures them that he could fix the problem. The next day, the mayor meets the ambulance driver in the former sprawling home in Kalawan. Their talk centers on the reports that the driver is being hunted down due to his complicity to the crime. Giving the driver 2,000 bucks, the mayor instructs him to shut his mouth, or better yet, to flee their town and hide in an undisclosed place. That same day, PNP Chief of Kalawan, Major Kanyo, received a pair of white shorts from Mayor Sanchez. The shorts were allegedly the ones Sarmento was wearing when she disappeared and was found. Sanchez said it was found near the National Highway by a card gambler, who then turned it over to him. According to the TV5 report, Sanchez sent the piece of evidence to throw the police off the trail, but the police's suspicions only grew since the shorts were found far from where Sarmento's body was actually found but the ambulance driver does take off as advised. However, on August 10th, 1993, his endeavors to remain hidden was halted. It is while doing some chores in a market in Manila when the CIS agents chance on him. 
Him and another one of the henchmen were arrested. The mayor later received an anonymous phone call advising him that he would better leave the country because he was to be arrested in three days' time. However, he refused to heed the advice because he swore that he had nothing to do with the crime. There were even reports that the mayor was giving away as much as $10,000 to the media and some people in power just so suspicion could be taken away from him. Whenever Sanchez would be seen in the news, he was always praying or bringing along with him an image of Mary, ironically Sarmenta's namesake. And as promised, Mayor Sanchez was apprehended on August 13, 1993, at his Calowan residence and brought to Camp Vicente Lim, where he was presented to the media. There he saw the ambulance driver and another one of his men who were arrested prior and did not greet him. The general ordered the two witnesses to implicate the mayor, then ordered that the mayor be handcuffed as he is the assaulter. The mayor then cursed to the general, you son of a bee, you framed me up. During the investigation, both the mayor and the rest of his men made an attempt to pin the crime to Teofilo, also known as Kit Alcaza, the 20-year-old son of a well-known and feared military general, dictator Alcaza. Even the presidential crime buster, Vice President Joseph Estrada, who had intruded into the picture, joins the endeavor in accusing this young man as the alleged brains behind the despicable deed. Kit Alcaza was another student at UPLB and a frat brother of Alan Gomez. According to one of the mayor's men, Alcaza was seen with bloody knuckles the day after the crime. The student, however, clarified that he had punched a wall. According to another one of the mayor's men, who had a more detailed story for the court, it was Alcaza who had been planning to kill Gomez over another girl named Rose. The morning when the bodies were found, he even said that Alcaza asked for his help in disposing Sarmenta's body. However, the M16 empty bullet shell recovered at the site where Gomez's body was found matched the gun registered to this man and not Alcaza. All of the collective efforts failed and Alcaza was eventually freed of suspicion. The case then enters the trial phase. The mayor and his men go up on appeal to the Supreme Court with Sanchez insisting on his innocence. Sanchez said, I can look them straight in the eye, even if they could crush us into fine pieces. We know that we have done nothing wrong. We have not raped anyone and we have not killed anyone. By this time, the case had caught the attention of the entire nation. Sanchez's private life was reported and dissected, including his eccentricity, his love of imported perfumes, and even his collagen treatments for his skin. And on March 11, 1995, after a grueling 16-month litigation, the tough lady judge who presided over the case renders her handwritten decision, convicting Mayor Antonio Sanchez of Calowan Town and his six loyal men of the crime of with homicide on seven counts. The lady magistrate is horrified at the evidence she has unearthed during the trial, prompting her to describe what happened to Eileen and Allen as a plot seemingly hatched in hell. Sanchez was also asked to pay millions in pesos to the families of the two victims as additional indemnity. However, Sanchez's family refused and still refused to pay the victims' families, believing in his innocence. The mayor's calm and religious persona suddenly disappeared when the verdict was read. He was described to have been raging and shouting expletives, giving the audience and the media a completely different side to him. Commenting on the student's parents, Sanchez told the media, I feel sorry for them because they have not received the right justice, still maintaining his innocence while claiming he was framed because of politics and his ambition to be a governor. Sanchez and his convicted henchmen are hauled to the National Penitentiary where they are to spend the rest of their lives until the year 2019. Sanchez is still imprisoned in 2019. 
but he reached headlines again when the Department of Justice announced that Antonio Sanchez would be released on August 20th, 2019, after serving only 24 years in prison. Sanchez's alleged good behavior granted his release through the Good Conduct Time Allowance Bill passed in 2013. But the news of his release caused national outrage and condemnation, with some even wondering how he could qualify for good conduct when he was caught seizing various items inside the prison, such as 1.5 million worth of drugs hidden in a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary in 2010 in an air conditioning unit in a flat screen TV in 2015. Three days later, the University of the Philippines at Los Banos, which was Eileen and Allen's alma mater, held a rally to oppose Sanchez's release, and Alan Gomez's mother was in attendance. Eileen's mother demanded that the authorities give concrete proof of his so-called good behavior. On August 26, President Rodrigo Duterte ordered his Justice Secretary and Bureau of Corrections Chief not to release convicted <laughs> murderer Antonio Sanchez. After six days of public outrage, they held back his release and fortunately for the country and the victim's families, Antonio Sanchez was pronounced dead on March 27, 2021. And only three of his henchmen have died in prison since 1993. May Eileen Sarmenta and Alan Gomez rest peacefully and may their families reach complete healing. Thank you all for watching.